And then to David Yao's surprise. He goes to take a sip out of his Coke this time. And uh, he, he tried like Coke. Well, no, it's it's uh, Brit's giant shit. Welcome to Every Album Ever with Mike and Alex. My name is Michael Mansour, and I'm joined, as always, by my lovely, wonderful, handsome, nice co-host, Alexander Volt. Say hello. Hello. This is Every Album Ever, the podcast where we listen to every single album in the world, one artist at a time, but mostly artists we like. Uh, so it's a new discography, more or less, per episode. And today, we'll be discussing every album by... Slint. Who? Slint. I've never heard of them, Alex. Oh, you haven't? I've not heard of them. Your wardrobe is almost that of a cartoon character if people just watch the... <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. No one knows what you're talking about, Alex. So I like this band. <laughs> and this is a you know, happy birthday to Mike because... Uh, it will be dropping on your birth or like the day before the two okay. days before, okay. you know, I don't really know close right. enough, close enough. Close. Yeah. The, yeah. The beginning month of July is uh, basically when, uh, when my birthday will be, but beginning half of the month of July, what the fuck am I talking about? Uh, yeah. Before getting to any of that, man, this is already such a stupid episode, dude, this is going to be the longest tiny discography episode we've probably ever done because I have a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To wait too much. It's, it's your birthday. It is my birthday. So if you want to help me out because it's my birthday or some shit, uh, subscribe and lean into the buttons and share and tell friends or all that stuff. If you would like uh, patreon.com slash every album ever, if you want to help us even more, we have bonus episodes, early access to certain episodes. And of course you can jump the line when suggesting an artist for us. We have uh, some new patrons. Welcome. Thank you. And also we have another Patron request because of that, which I am actually excited for. Nice. It sounds like a fun one. I won't give it away. Uh, but that should be coming up in a few weeks or so. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, playlist on Slint. You'll find a description, find a link in the description along with playlists with, you know, every episode we've done. Uh, everyallmember.com if you want to just go straight to there. Uh, whatever. You know, it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. You follow us and do the things. Uh, <clears throat> slint, slint, slint. So... I, uh, yeah, obviously if you're watching the video, you know, I like the band. I, I uh, have like four band t-shirts that I wear on loop and this is one of them. Yeah. I believe I'm wearing this shirt in our trailer. Like I, yeah. I like this band. <laughs> I think it's pretty uh, apparent and just how much I like this band. Well, thank you for asking Alex a lot. This okay. band is one of those, uh, moment in life where nothing is the same again. This band yeah. changed my musical life and outlook completely. I, I heard them. Uh, first time when I was 13 and that will wreck a 13 year old when, I mean, I've listened to weird shit since I was younger, but like there's something about this is like the pinnacle of what rock music can be. Obviously yeah. the, it, you can do more stuff with it, you can do different stuff with it, but this was like at the time, uh, this is what you would recognize as rock music, which is so advanced and so evolved in a way that's not prog rock. It's not math rock. It's just, it's digestible, but really, really intricate and patient it is the most mm -hmm. relaxed patient we're, we'll we'll do our thing and we're not worried about whether you're going to be here by the end of it yeah that's very much the uh the vibe i got from the band too and watching the documentary um hey it didn't uh hit for me as a teenager but once i got a little bit older i was like okay okay this is this is cool stuff and this is also i say that as a fucking psycho kid who also at 13 heard swans for the first time. Yeah. So I'm listening to early swans, you know, the shit that really you shouldn't listen to, like, especially if you're like, you know, a depressed young child. And then also this, which is like, I mean, you couldn't get two, two different things, but like, yeah, I would say this you, one you, you, reverberated more. Yeah. You yeah. could show normal people slint. Like for the most it's, part, it's weird, but it's not like, um, you know, it's not like a Captain Beefheart no, situation. No. You, you'll raise, like, I don't know. It's still like, so I've, I've, man, of course I have a story about a fucking annoying girl and she's not annoying. She was super annoying. I think she was in a cult, to be honest. This was a uh, early twenties or late teens. And, uh, I, I picked her up in my old shitty Honda and I had, the uh one of the slint albums played the the slint album let's just be mm -hmm. honest here all right yeah. you can see it in the background on the video it's, it's, let's, let's be honest and she was like baffled at the thought of someone who couldn't sing trying to sing and i was like Hup. it happens all the time it's like, yeah but also do you not hear the rest of it do you not understand that there's more to music than 
singing? Do you yeah. not, do you not under, like, do you, are you fucking stupid? I didn't say that, but like in my head, I'm like, that's you. You're not my kind of person. I don't, I don't think we're, we're on the same universe here. Also, it's, uh, it's really weird thinking about like someone would think that, and then it sounds like I'm throwing shade at Little Yachty, but you get like a Little Yachty. Who's Hootie? Little Yachty. He did that song Broccoli with uh, with Dram. Who are the Dram? <laughs> is that rappers. a wrestler? What the fuck they're are you rappers. talking about? The rappers. <laughs> okay, okay. My point being, Lil Yachty is not much of a singer. Okay. And the people just welcome him with open arms. So like, I would say in general, people don't care about singing. It's yeah. It's like, does it sound good? Okay. Well, to be fair, that girl was all, was a singer singer, mm. but- it's also kind of baffling to me when you're a musician and you can't appreciate really complex arrangements and brilliant songwriting. Like, like stuff about these guys are just purely undeniable. Even if you don't like, you know, slower, uh, slower burn kind of rock or or minimalist rock, which is mm-hmm. a lot of it is pretty minimal. Uh, again, if you're a musician, if you and you're denying just how there is no one tighter and more on it than this band. Like, it, it blows my fucking mind to think like, how is it? Well, I'll get into it more with the album specifically, yeah. but it's, I couldn't believe until like, I, I finally saw them live. Like, oh my God, they're this tight. There was no studio trickery at all. Mm-hmm. This, they're just this good all the time. That was something uh, they went over to in the, or Albini bought up in the documentary is it's like, uh, called Brick Come Trail directed by Lance Bangs. Yes. Bangs, was that they were very proud of their demo tapes and they yeah. were not trying to change much. Yeah. And that's also a, you know, su- well, like you said, Albini, he's a, he's a big part of this band. Uh, but that's, that's one of his main philosophies is just capture the band. Don't, you know, try to spice it up. I don't agree with that for every band, but I get, I appreciate it with bands like this where they can fucking back it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had no idea this band like big black. I had, I had, I couldn't tell by the, the harmonics. I had, I had no fucking idea. You, you, it's just I'm the thing the, like some sarcasm. There. Yeah, I know. I know. But like, it's also this, <laughs> We're only talking about the album when we have two two things, two records to talk about before the album, as well as how the band. Okay, I'm just kind of talking about their sound in general. The thing is, their sound evolves so crazily, so quickly. It does. It, it's a but- fucking. It's like a light switch. It's one album is this thing, and then the next one is this fucking untouched, un not done really that well since, never done before. Then it's like mm-hmm. a, it's baffling to me almost, like how how they just just like came together and like oh, it's just and the way they talk about it. In interviews and in, in the doc and wherever, it's like I don't know, just playing, just wrote some riffs and just kind of I, jammed it out. Like, but it's, you realize it's fucking genius, right? How does how like they're the dorkiest, fucking quiet, boring guys to watch? It's I would say they act unassuming and boring, but then hearing some of these stories, also I got the stories written down, dude. <laughs> also, they were like they were babies when they were doing this. Like, they're very young. Yeah. Well, by the time, yeah, they were like college age by the time the last album was recorded, I think, but they'd been, they had been playing since they were fucking. Yeah. Like that band, um, shit. The one that starts with an M I forgot to write. Oh, Maurice. Maurice got to open up for Sam Hain. Sam Hain. It's such a a funny fucking story. Teenagers opening up for Sam Hain. It's It's insane. Episode something. We did them. Uh, People hate that episode. It's funny. Uh, It's uh, It's just dancing, making all the, uh, the burner accounts. (laughs) Why does he keep saying dancing? My name is not dancing. (laughs) It rolls off my tongue better. I'm not going to (laughs) change. Also, uh, I think their other band, um, which one before Maury, uh, languid and flaccid after that, after that, that was squirrel bait, squirrel bait. Yeah. They opened up while I'm on saying things wrong. They opened up for Husker Do. <laughs> Husker Do? Husker. See the two dots above the U. I know. Acts. I know. Uh, that, they, that one I do sig- on purpose. They signify the. And I know. Uh, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fucking. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. So these guys were in bands so young. So let's just well, start out from the very, very beginning. The Slint is essentially Britt Walford. Like he's the, the fucking guy. Yes. And then also his lifelong buddy, childhood friend, Brian McMahon. And uh, Louisville, Kentucky, the most unassuming yeah. city, the most like, huh? Who? Where? Is uh, is very cool. Uh, I think of of ras- wrestling. When okay, I think of Louisville, but um, it's very cool seeing the documentary and like how progressive. Uh, it's Brit's parents, right? Yeah, like Ron and Charlotte. Yeah, 
Like, of course, I know the names because uh, it, well, it's on the album. People, yeah, we'll get to it. it's this really funny. Like you would think they'd be like these controlling, like conservative people, but no, they just like let them do their yeah. own thing. The they drove them they, and took them to punk shows. They were so sweet. They're the nicest parents. Clearly, like they're really good people still in their uh, lives. And, like, uh, yeah, re- and honestly, they all seem like just regular ass, boring, good people. And that's like good food for them. But like, it's funny watching them as like these innovators. And again, you hear these stories of them being fucking wild, mostly Brit being a fucking psychopath. Oh, but you see Jesus. interviews of them. He's like, and uh, here, here's when um we played this show at that. It's like, which, what the, are you talking to me? What the fuck are you saying? Like, yeah. holy shit. Like I told, I told you this uh, not too long ago. They, uh, Brit and I think Brian, they've been more active on social media stuff. A lot of touch and go has been, mm-hmm. uh, it was recently the 30th anniversary for Spiderland, so they did a uh, you know a whole thing, the new shirts, new merch, whatever, and they were doing a uh, part of that was Brit doing a series on parts of Louisville where Slint came up, uh, the, the places that they went to, their first you know gigs, their first everything, and it was it was impossible to watch. It was impossible yeah. to watch. Like there was no one less riveting than Britt Walford and there is no one better at drums than Britt Walford it's he, yeah oh my he's, god he's a madman like trying to like dissect specifically what he's doing yeah. like note by note it's just like why why would you throw that in there right now when it, it's this yep. but it sounds good it sounds amazing I don't know when it would come up again but the reason this guy is a psychopath and the thing that like kind of broke me and where I stopped the documentary because I was just so, so like, OK, like, yeah, very boring guys. And then they get to this part where him and David Yao, David Yao. Are, are building someone's office at Touch and Go. It's at Corey Rust, the, the head of Touch and Go. OK. Yeah. And. Uh, Brett had like a slushy or a Coke or something. David Yao thought he was done with it. It was a Coke. Yeah, it was, it was, Coke. he was this like hadn't touched it in hours. He thought he was done. He put a cigarette in it. Brett drinks from it. Yeah. He's like, oh, why? Why would you do that? He's like, oh, I'm not bad. I'm sorry. I thought you yeah. were. Yeah, I thought you were done. And then to David Yao's surprise. What's his chagrin? <laughs> Some would say he goes to take a sip out of his Coke this time. And uh, he, he tried Coke. Well, no, it's it's a uh, Brit's giant shit. Took a dump right right in the emptied out the Coke. Took a dump in it. And David Yao said that was funny. <laughs> he said I laughed. If anyone does that to me, we're done. We're that, not. I would. We're not on speaking terms anymore. And that is where you and I are different because I would laugh my ass off. Just if, like you, the, if you drink shit, I would. No, he didn't drink it. He just tried to drink. And he saw it. Like, oh, okay, yeah, he didn't drink okay, the shit. okay. No, I think. He, I think it would take a minute before it got to from your nose to your mouth and your also your eyes. Well, it would be hard to drink. Shit. Well, the way I, I thought he this had like a straw, and who knows, maybe it's no. a runny shirt. No. Okay, okay. No, no. I think he, he just took a just took a dump and he, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no, that that's fucking hilarious. I like I don't encourage that behavior, but if it happened, I'd appreciate the fucking innovation and the the, <laughs> the boldness and risk that it takes to take a a dump outside of the bathroom setting. Probably no toilet paper stealthily stealthily in, inside a small container as a prank there's a lot of work and thought there's involved a lot, in that. there's yeah. a lot of work there but i've taken a few public deuces and uh it's it's hard to do i bet you feel like st- you- so you gotta make sure there's some some cover on at least two sides of you yeah i think uh buddy of ours we we, we uh we went to to joshua tree and like right when we got to, like the gate <laughs> not 10 minutes later he's like i gotta take shit guys <laughs> And there's nothing. There's wilderness. There's nothing. It's just a fucking yeah. desert. So, well, I mean, you can go over yonder and just. <laughs> yeah. So he did. He did. He just went in the like in the middle of no, just standing surrounded by Joshua trees. Uh, took a dump and he said it was one of the most liberating feelings, feelings he's ever had. Nice. <laughs> and so I, we should all just start taking dumps in public, people. Yeah. Also, something about Joshua tree. This brings it out in you. There's a. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know that that stretch a highway like right after the casino. Oh, I after I, Morongo. I've been on it. Yeah, I've been on it. I don't know the name of it. There's a stretch of highway. That, this is like kind of like you know you're getting into the desert. There is a casino, and then you go into Joshua Tree from there, and there is nothing for a long time. Yeah. You go up hills and mountains, and one time it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I thought it was going to happen. Oh shit! Oh, 
Oh shit. I was so close. Oh in, man. In front of my girlfriend at the time oh, too. Oh, there's no coming back from that. Uh, that no. was strained right from that point on. Yeah. I think that's what uh, did us in was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I saw a part of you. No man should ever see of you, Alex. Yeah. I made I made it, but I thought that was the day. Oh man. I, I almost shit myself day. driving one time. Too. Yeah. I was speeding home. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking made it though. So haven't made it every time. It's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> Sometimes I think about if a cop pulled me over right now, I think I would just go home, like lean out my window. I really have to like give me the ticket, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But like I'm going inside to take care of this, and we can, you know, we can sell this shit later. Yeah, all right? yeah. Because this shit can't wait till no, later. No, no, no. It's a tsunami. God damn it. But and now we did Brit proud by talking about poop for a while. Will. We'll get into it. Well, oh, there, yeah. That's, there's more poop that's stuff. That's right. I forgot. There is uh, more poop stuff. So, yeah, Britt and Brian met uh, in like, Ch Ch like children. Children, they were like 11, 12. And um, they went to a school where the school's like, you make your own rules. It's, it was like they called the Brown School. It's like, it was a kind of artsy. It was just like, it took a really hands off approach yeah. to pedagogy, which is like, I mean, I'm cool with that, but I bet they didn't learn. But they were saying in the dogs, like, I mean, we didn't do, we didn't learn much. We yeah. just, like, we, Oh, it was cool. Yeah, <laughs> but like, I mean, that's why they're so fucking quiet. But yeah, like you know, kind of inseparable best friends. And uh, <clears throat> then they they got into the hardcore scene, and they were you know fucking kids when when it was going on. So the I didn't, I'm not too familiar with the Louisville hardcore scene. I I, I know the name, the band uh, Malign Malignant Growth, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the biggest band from Louisville, which is like the funniest sentence I've ever said. <laughs> like the biggest band from Louisville, Malignant Growth. Like no one, is, like even, even amongst punk circles, that's like who? who? Yeah, it's very like interesting. Like the the brief section they spend on it, learning like oh, there is like an art and punk scene in yeah in Louisville. Well, Louisville during the eighties, man, it was it was all over. Like the Midwest was a very condensed part. Uh, part of the country where all those bands are coming from because they were desperate for something like mm -hmm. there's nothing to do and everybody's like a fucking rag dude so a lot of, a lot of great bands came from midwest and a lot of them ended, ended up some more veering toward you know chicago area that was a really big scene and then um but where are the where are the, where the ones are big scenes i forget but there's like a lot of good bands that came Ma from like the middle of nowhere like i think detroit's and came from middle of nowhere like milwaukee and stuff uh it's, it's yeah it's, it was a really interesting time but they were fucking children though. They were like yes, like little yes. kids, and they were in this hardcore band. So they go to play a show, and I think the guy from Malignant Youth was saying that they were too small to even carry their amps in. They had <laughs> they had to have other like grown men or just uh, yeah. older kids bring it in. Like these fucking children are here. Yeah. It's like it's so endearing, but like holy holy shit, man. <laughs> yeah, fucking. I and mean, I've done that. I was old enough to carry my app, but I was like thirteen when I yeah. started, first started doing shows. It's like it's fucking weird looking, man. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like, yeah, I've, uh, not like playing the show part, but like gone with friends and we've, we've been those kids where it's like, who the fuck invited them? Like, yeah. The first, first show I ever went to was a punk band called seven seconds. And that was, I was 12, oh, shit. It was 12. Yeah. And like, it seems like a, a weird place for a 12 year old, but at the, at the very least the people that my brother's. Uh, they put like, that we were in the, uh, the fucking balcony. Mm -hmm. So at least it, it wasn't like I was, you know, getting smacked by 16 year olds or anything, but still that's uh it's funny to imagine. So like they did that. Um, and then after, after that two, it kind of split into two bands. Squirrel bait was one of them where Brit and Brian were now playing there. Brian guitar vocals, uh, Brit drums, vocals in case we didn't uh, mention it earlier. And, they were they were kind of successful. Like they they I think they put out a few records. They did some touring. Uh, Brick got tired of it and then went and formed Maurice with David Paho, who later joined Slint. David uh, Paho, along with a, a million other bands. Also, like unsung guitar hero. I think. He is. It's, it's one not of the same under, band if they don't have David. He's it's, one of the most underrated guitar players, and he's he's appreciated more now, yes. which I'm glad. Yeah. But he's still very much an, an, under, an underground guy. He's improved so many things just with him being there he's a he's a fucking great dude i don't know about personally but i mean he seems cool he but, seems like yeah this like the rest of the dudes yeah it's like well, he, honestly he seemed and, a little bit more like a human than the rest of all of them. the rest of them seem kind of deadpan he seemed at least like 
a little bit charming. He but, had emotions. Yeah. He's wearing a Mashuga shirt. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> for, and Doc, he is wearing a Mashuga shirt. Uh, so, yeah, so they joined that. They split into two, those two bands. And uh, what am I saying? Yeah, yeah. So Britt opted for Maurice. Brian stayed in Squirrel Bait. And then uh, eventually uh, the thing happens with Maurice where uh, I think it was a singer for Maurice who looks like fucking comedian Robert Kelly. Uh, he, he does. He uh, he befriended Danzig at a Sam Haynes show, which is like the funniest thing to imagine because you hear this guy talking, talking like hot, like kind of like Bobby Kelly, like just he's like fast talking, kind of like kind of like a really uh, salt of the earth, really blue mm-hmm. collar kind of fucking this fucking guy over here. Obviously, he didn't have a New York accent, but uh him ta- imagine him talking to Danzig just that makes me laugh that yeah, the image of them yeah. hitting it off it's like huh really but so yeah someone asked Morris to open for them and that was actually pretty that was pretty freaking neat I think more uh Brit was 14 when that happened yeah fucking 14 dude that's that's insane yeah but I think uh so so to finally lead into talking about the band slint uh the we the way I at least registered registered to me was like the, the kind of moment that they kind of became slint was Paho started listening to the Minutemen. Yep. And then he's like, I should start playing with clean guitars. And the people at Maurice didn't like it. Well, the singer didn't like yeah. it. He's like, what the fuck do I do here? Yeah. So they, they, they wrote one song and it was mostly clean. It was super proggy. It was almost, it was like a fast, faster, more aggressive slint. And that was kind of like the first slint song. And after that, they broke up and just changed the name. Uh, got a new bass player. Obviously the singer was no longer there. Brian came back and uh now we got slint yes and they uh yes they uh they wanted to be on touch and go and uh approached steve albini about recording their first album after you know shows and stuff yeah it's funny there was like man there's some shows uh i think their first show was before their their name they were called slint oh Oh, at the church it was at a unitarian church service that that brit's parents organized pretty much or something like that and i don't think they did because that's one i like they seem cool whatever but then they were like oh we were like worried it was like some kind of cult or like wait when did they say that Uh, that was their church okay i don't know why the hell they said that then like i did not imagine that I i thought they were talking about the band like the band itself like I thought they were talking about like they I thought were, they were talking about the fucking fan letters. I thought they were talking about like the fucking church. I thought it was someone else's. I don't know. I'm gonna go back and rewatch this shit now. I, I think it was. I think it was. The, well, maybe it wasn't. You know, yeah. maybe I fucking forgot. But either way, it, it is a weird first show. It, it, <laughs> it's very yeah. weird. Yeah. Like this kind of band, any kind of non-Christian rock band, because they all fucking suck. But any kind of non-Christian rock band playing at a at a church is just how is that a good idea like how is it 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 does not seem like a good idea and it wasn't here because nobody was interested it was a full-on service like the way it's you know the the aisles and stuff like it's it's fucking whack like someone kept one of the like programs and it's like chanting hymns yeah and then like rock music performed yeah. by and then whatever the fuck yeah it was some stupid weird name that they they just put as a placeholder about like tuffled hair or, yeah uh, beans or beads or something like that i forgot um but after that they changed the name to slint which i was always curious about what the hell it was it's just it was just a made-up word that brit named named his fish yeah yeah it's like it's someone just made it up like everything is about about them is boring the the, the, the there's it's, no origin story everything is fucking boring it's, it's just amazing music it's the finding out about the origins of their stuff is like being around people who will like have a good laugh at something you think is random and then they tell you the inside joke and you're like it's not that funny you guys. had to be there you had to fucking be there dude that's that's the whole thing with inside jokes is like you can't it, you can't, you can't inside, replicate. Yeah. You can't inside someone else. Like either you were there when it happened, or like uh, you you understand it, but you just don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a. Uh, and then also uh, speaking of inside jokes, that's all Brit and Brian were, according to everyone. Mm-hmm. And I- I- Makai is in the documentary too, and even he was like, "Yeah, it's like, I mean, they just it was weird just being like they just they're, they're clearly doing like a thing that no one else gets except for them." It's yeah. Like, like and what I, was it like if someone farts you have to touch the doorknob oh, and dude hold on yeah 
Did you have that game growing up? No. I sure did. Yeah. Maybe it's a fucking hood thing, dude. Because I, I remember when I first saw this <laughs> the, document. The hood in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> dude, we're all dirt poor. We're all garbage. <laughs> so, like, uh, the, the, the fucking door. Anybody who's trash knows that there's a, a game that young men t- like to play where if you someone farts, they have to say, uh, for us, it was, you have to say safety. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't, if you fart and you don't say safety, if someone else in the same room says doorknob, they start punching you until you can grab a doorknob. That yeah. is who, what fucking psychopath invented that game? I don't know, but it, it, it had it's some a thing. Apparently it had some widespread appeal. Apparently. Yeah. So they played a game quite like that. Ian Mackay was there one day and he's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? He's like, oh yeah. If you, if you fart, you have to go grab a doorknob or else you start punching, punch. Uh, he's like, you get punched. Ian, Ian was like, go ahead, punch me. Punch me. I dare you to punch me. <laughs> I was like, I'll fucking do that. I'll play that shit. <laughs> Which is like the most respectable answer to when you, some asshole says, oh, if you fart, I'm going to hit you. Like, <laughs> Also, like what a dick move. Like they wasn't set up before. It was like after the fact. Well, I mean, I, think I know it's not like, out. no, it's yeah. just stupid. It's kids being kids. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. And clearly Ian was older than them. And I played that when I was like 14 yeah. as well. Like, you know, I don't fucking whatever. It's really stupid, but. Because I don't know when I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I remember a friend coming up with fart football. Uh-huh. And I believe it's like 20 or 30 minutes and you get points for your, your farts. Uh-huh. Like the good ones are seven. <laughs> the weak ones are Touchdown. like three. Okay. And then whoever has the most points at the end of like 30, 20 minutes. How many people shit themselves playing this game? <laughs> no one that I know of. Man, that's, that's like... I get it on paper as a funny idea, but just in the room, it must be a fucking nightmare to be in that room. Awful, yeah, dude. That sounds—it's just stupid. I remember my mom getting pissed about how bad my bedroom would smell. That's a valid reason, dude. (laughs) Fuck. Uh, But wait, what am I calling? What what was saying? Uh, Oh yeah, one last story because before I move on. Big Jesus Lizard fan. I'm I'm assuming you like them at least. Yes. Fucking. The song, I mean, the song Mouth Breather, I think it's, it's one of the a, better songs. It's, about, <laughs> it's the, about Brit. It's yeah. about Brit, which I remember I, I, when I first heard this fucking story, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how fucking brilliant it was. Like, so anybody, anybody doesn't know, this is a song called Mouth Breather by the band The Jesus Lizard, the guy of David Yao with the shit cup. That's the band he sung for. Um, and in the song, the main, the most intelligible line, it's like a recurring chorus line is, don't get me wrong. He's a nice guy. I like him just fine but he's a mouth breather. <laughs> that is a direct quote from Steve Albini about Britt Walford. Yeah. Because he, <laughs> he asked, he's tired of it. <laughs> he asked him, he asked Britt to house it for him when he was going out of town one, for one weekend or so. And right, like right at the beginning, like almost immediately Britt locked himself out. So his solution was to kick the front door in, nail it shut with a two by four. And then do all his comings and goings through the window in the, from the attic. So that was like already like, okay, that's a really fucking stupid, S- like that's, crazy that's, that's thing. insanely stupid. And also wildly like hard to do. Yeah. Like it's, it's hard to be an idiot like that. Like, yeah. holy fuck. And then in the same, the same house sitting trip, uh, he fucked up his toilet and like he clogged it up. And he caused the entire bathroom to flood and it started leaking piss water all over uh, Albina's studio like on, on the oh, lower I didn't floors. Know that part. Oh, yeah. So he just fucked up Albini's house <laughs> so bad. So Albina's like, hey, man, don't get me wrong. He's a nice guy. Like, just fine. But he's a mouth breather. Yeah. And that's, I mean, goddamn. That's one of my favorite music stories, maybe ever. It sounds like more ideas people pitched for an Encino Man script than a thing a real life person would do. Yeah. So it's like hearing, hearing all these stories about Brit being this fucking wild prankster jackass and then looking at him talk and he's not, he's not emoting at all. Like he yeah. laughed a couple times maybe, but it's just, it's just wild. Like, fuck man, You really don't know people. You don't know people. <laughs> like you fucking think, you know, people, you don't know shit. It's why it's, it's almost beautiful. But so I guess I don't by, by far, probably one of the longest setups we've ever done. Good because they have three records, two albums, one EP. A uh, very brief lifespan, extremely brief. Uh, first album came out in 1989. Last album, 1991. And uh, oh boy, Alex, you ready? I'm ready. Well, let's do it. This is uh, 1989's Tweez.
Oh, oh, all right. That could be a big black riff. Yep, 100%. That can't. That jazzy. No. no. Their uh, their voices on these tracks, you can tell they're real, real, real dweeby. Young. Yeah, yeah, real dweeby, real young. That's that's Brian. He sounds just like Steve Albini, except like more of a bitch. <laughs> I love the guy, but you know, he just sounds dweeby. I love this guitar line. Is, and this is Pouch, huh? This is David. Uh, yeah. Okay. Pa- Paho, yeah, yeah, yeah so. sorry, Paho. Oh, it takes a minute, but this song really fucking it rips. Ah, oh, goddamn it! All right, yeah. I really fucking I really are, I really love that song. Are we doing accolades on this? Episode? Yeah, if that, we're doing accolades. Yeah, Morris least favorite. <laughs> same. Yeah. <laughs> no contest wars. This is not that great of an album. And I, I like it. I, I actually thought I thought I was gonna like hate it more because mm-hmm. I used to not like this album at all. I like it just fine. I think it's one of the best albums I've ever given Worst Least Favorite to. It is. It might be my, I think it's my number one favorite worst album. Yeah. I, yeah because I've listened to this from my own free will. It's, <laughs> like, it's amazing. But when you're only dealing with three pieces of uh, hot garbage. Yeah. No, yeah, dude. yeah. Yeah. Dude. Fucking. So. Also, I like that they pulled a, they thought it'd be funny to pull a shotgun on Steve L. Bean. Oh, fuck. I forgot about that. Yeah. Dude, that's such a wild story. So it was, uh, oh man, it was, the, it was recording. No, it was, was it this album or the EP after? It was the, it was this one. It was this one. So the only member I believe that Steve L. Bean didn't know was the bassist. I forgot the bass. Evan, is it Evan? Ethan? Uh, Ethan something on here. Uh, Ethan, no, no, yeah, Ethan Buckler, e- yeah, Ethan Buckler. So, Albini didn't know, had never met Ethan. So these guys thought it'd be hilarious. I was like, "Hey, Ethan, why don't you go up there with a shotgun? You knock on the door, you point it at him when he answers the door." It so, was, uh, it was empty, and it, it, it was a like gift, like, "Oh, you're," re-, but yeah. So they did that, yeah. And Albini, uh, well, he promptly uh, slammed the door. And then, like thirty seconds later, he opens. It, he's like, "All right, come on in." Yeah. <laughs> Let's take so it's. I love that that they knew he would be smart enough to get like, okay, all right, yeah. That like that yeah. would never ever fly these days. Like ever fly these days. No, no. no. There's that was just back in fucking eighties when people just walked around holding guns just everywhere. Also, I guess you're in Kentucky. So well, they. No, I they, don't they know dro- where the studio. They drove was. to Chicago. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure. Well, you know what? I don't know exactly if. If Albin is always in Chicago, I yeah. think it's a safe bet. But yeah, this, so this album I think is not only their weakest, but holy crap, this has some real problems. Like it has what I okay, what I like about it is that you do hear all the potential that would thankfully get mm. elaborated upon. But number one reason why I, I find this to be a tough listen sometimes, that, that fucking guitar. Really? I, I think it's a miserable, miserable guitar tone. And I didn't, I would, I heard, I've heard that criticism of the sub before, like the guitar specifically is a, is a really weird, cheap sound that kind of hurts it. And I didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. And this time I finally understand it because of specifically which songs, um, bah, 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 bah. it's for sure. Rhoda is one of them. And where, what's the other one? What's the other one? You know what? It's, it's that was the only one that that really offended me but most of them kind of have this it's really chorusy mm-hmm. it sounds like a like if Kirk Cobain's guitar tone sucked like like a worse version of the Kirk Cobain sound where it's very it's big and chorusy and a little bit echoey and almost has like a metal edge to it where it has that chunkiness but there's no punch and every time there's like a big fucking you know payoff every time there's a big culmination everybody kind of comes in it just feels flimsy and it feels like there's no real real kick it's uh it's funny how the bass player ethan would end up leaving the band because he did not like the way it he sounded like, yeah he blamed, and, a lot of you blame steve albini for yeah you know? and it's funny like when they interview both of them they're both this like 
I would have done that. They're both like yeah. so, man enough to be like, oh, I yeah, I would have done it different. Yeah, exactly. Steve was different. like, he uh, I think he blamed me for not liking it. And you know what? He's, he's, he's right. Yeah, he's, yeah. Right. he's probably right. Yeah. And I mean, like, again, you're just trying shit. And at the time, like now we can look back at all of Albini's work and be like, Albini is the fucking man. Like no one captures a live sound the way that guy does, but he wasn't always Albini. This is 89. He was so, still, yeah, yeah. Coming up. And like the big, the big black records, we did them too, by the way, the big black records, they sound good, but they don't sound like Albini good, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, this is just, he's always experimenting. Even with in utero, he was experimenting. I think he taped tape microphones to the floor and shit. Like, let's just say yeah. he's always, always fucking around trying to find something new. And, uh, so this one, yeah, I think everything sounds pretty good. Those drums sound fantastic, as most Albini drums sound. Yep. Not to mention that Brit loves a big drum, and I love me a big drum. Yes, his... Like a fucking 87-inch bass drum with no padding in it. It's just... That was the... It's a uh, fucking queef. I love it. That was the thing that, like, blew me away when I saw them live, which I almost missed because... Uh, FYE, what should be called Fuck Yeah Festival, it was fucking animals, like, couldn't get in, and I'm, like, I'm gonna miss oh, it. Oh, 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 okay, you mean uh, F-Y-F? The, F- F- Did you say, oh, yeah, yeah, did you say yeah, F-Y-E? Sorry, the, that's the, the, a, yeah. <laughs> F-Y- a yeah. F-Y-F, <laughs> Fuck Yeah Festival yeah. in LA used to be this little thing. Now it's this gigantic thing, and I went... And I was so excited to see Slint. And we were in line for like an hour or more. Mm-hmm. Like, because we had got there early yeah. because Slint played early. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well, you need to like get there to like get in, f- you know, a good seat or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the line was not fucking moving. And I, I think uh, f- fr- uh, my friend Dylan, he took control, found a way in. And we just like yeah, yeah. ran in and we, we caught them and yeah, that's I w- lucky. That would have been a fucking, I would have, uh, I would, I will, I was still trying to get my money back because just because you almost cost me legendary show. Yes. They don't play ever. Yeah. yeah. No, I've been very upset. Um, but yeah, I was just like blown away by like how good those drums sound live to like is, it carries it, yeah. over to it, like everything they do. It's really, it's, it's I, it, you don't realize how rare it is until you see someone do it right, and Brit's like such a fucking brilliant musician. He's like, God damn, this his choices are always so. Not only are they, does he reel it back when he needs to, and it's subtle, but when he does something weird, it's like it's like, it's like the drums have their own their own ar- arrangements. A stupid word. It, they have their own melody. Essentially, mm-hmm. he'll throw in like this weird little bell thing, and you'll always hear that bell thing. It's like. It's the same thing that they do with harmonics. They'll throw in a, one little harmonic note in the middle of a riff, and it, it on first listen you might think it's an accident until you keep hearing it repeating. Mm-hmm. Well, that's part of the riff. Because because like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't repeat in like a a four four or like bar type thing where you're like, oh, I know when that's gonna come in, or at least not on first listen. You it'll like, be like really the, have yeah, to on the, on the on the like the the offbeat or whatever or the uh, the upbeat or something where. Yeah, you'll hear a thing just come in when you when you don't expect. It's just it makes it sound a lot bigger than it is. It's very mm-hmm. Ginger Baker esque, where every limb is doing a different thing and mm-hmm. kind of makes the drums sound four times as big. So it's very jazzy in that sense. I and mean, obviously, he's like he's uh, he would play with jazz guys later on and blues guys and stuff. And you know, musician, well versed. You know, that's saying that's not saying anything too controversial. I don't think. But <clears throat> uh, songs that I like since. Uh since Mike's done shitting on the band that he loves. Not even close. Not even close. <laughs> I have a lot of shitting on this album. <laughs> I like not Nanding. Nanding. Best my favorite song on the album. Yeah. By, this, far, by far. That's also like captures what Slint is. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of pretty. Yeah. It's you yeah, put a put on that bitch. That okay. song, it's so to the point and so gorgeous. Instrumental. Well, okay, we'll talk about the vocals. It's a they're very complicated vocal band. <laughs> Fucking drum, dude. Nice and bright. Oh, yeah. This is one of my uh, favorite drum lines, I think, ever on this next riff. (laughs) 
that's just like, oh, oh man. God damn. It's so nice. It's so good, yeah. I fucking lose it to this song. Oh. Those fucking drums, man. Oh, God. So fucking good. Uh, yeah, it's lovely. It's driving. It's lovely. Those fucking, yeah, they give me goosebumps, man. Uh, but vocally, this band is not a singy band. They're they're like the one of the earliest post-rock bands, I guess you can call it. Yeah. Also, the, um, I mean, this one, I didn't really like pay attention to the the vocals because it's just like conversations they recorded yeah ambient conversations some kind of it, it, everything last minute the vocals to these guys were so not a fucking like they did what folk what no vocals who gives a shit these guys didn't care about vocals at all they for every record pretty much every record with vocals they like wait to the last second to fucking mm-hmm. get it done which i completely understand i literally, literally do the same thing myself but like uh so here it was like oh let's just hit record and you know whatever we're you know just pick up the ambient conversation we'll throw that in there and the opening song ron you hear oh steve these headphones are fucked up yeah obviously regular conversation and the other thing they did was make a bunch of fucking racket dude they're just like clanging and hitting stuff and it's super annoying i don't think it's a deal breaker but it is fucking annoying also i didn't i didn't i guess i didn't catch shit but uh on top of rackets you know what else they like to record? What's that, Alex? Buttholes. What? What? They record poo? They do. They do. This band loves shit. Dude, it was... And it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> it is funny because it was taken from a tape they made called Anal Breathing. Anal Breathing, yeah. Uh, so there's a clip. It sounds like a guy taking a shit because it yeah, is uh, most likely. Most likely is. They, so during the doc... I think it's Lance, the director, that asked Britt, uh, so uh, is there any truth to, uh, you know, it's, it's someone taking a shit? And he just laughs. And he laughs, he laughed, and he said, I, I, no, no comment on that. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> Which means, yeah. Of course, you- also, I don't know what the shame in, like, oh, I recorded the noises of someone taking a shit. <laughs> what is, just, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, there's already a dude talking about how you took a shit in his coke yeah. like recording the noise of it is yeah this the tip of the iceberg in fact i want to know more brit yeah. please let us know more yeah. so there's that and i think out of all the sounds all the vocals ambient stuff all the shit and the most offensive thing in terms of the goofy production with the random sounds by far the opening to kent i like Kent. i fucking hate that shit dude it's asmr of like someone drinking stuff with the whole the, the lip smacking and it's like it makes me fucking ugh. you're putting it on aren't you yeah. So, ah! oh yeah that's good I hate it so good people who like ASMR are mentally ill what I cater to you <laughs> you do <laughs> Alex does ASMR raps on our Patreon Patreon account slash every member <laughs> This is so like that's short. a good riff though. Yeah, it's so short. This is like I got some kraut rock vibes from this song. There's like I don't know if it's like electronics or a, a keyboard or something. I don't think it's either of those things, honestly. I, I hate point. this fucking riff so much. This is goddamn honky tonk. They're so, from Louisville. Oh yeah, that's right. So that that riff is the main reason I don't really care for that song. I do think, goddamn, when is it? Um. Maybe I have a timestamp here. Yeah, around 320. Uh it picks up like a motherfucker, and then it has this really, really long, uh, kind of minimal solo that I think is really good. Mm-hmm. If it weren't for that second half, I would fucking load that song. Uh, and then I also don't I don't really like Charlotte. I think it's a good pacer. Mm-hmm. Like, like I like that it comes after Kent, and it's like it's way more angry, way more pissed off, way more ugly, honestly. Uh so it feels good from a pacing standpoint, but I don't like the song. I think it's like, it's, it feels kind of sloppy, which is unusual for them. Uh, and it's also like super, super ugly, like just, ugh. Uh, but it, there's a lot of surprising diversity that sounds the same because it's, everything's produced so similarly. Mm-hmm. Every guitar sounds just like that. Everything sounds exactly the same from song to song. But you listen to shit like fucking, what is it? Darlene? Damn near pop. You know? Yeah, or like Carol, it's pretty groovy. Yeah, pretty groovy. Not to mention, it's like 
it starts out like really fucking heavy too. It's got yeah. that, almost a sludginess to it. Could have been a Pantera song in Could a different be. different universe. <laughs> Man, that'd be a weird universe. But uh, yeah, like the the most disappointing song I think for sure was Rhoda to me because it has some oh, fucking yeah. awesome moments, but there's no punch that you can't. That guitar feels like the weakest thing ever, and there's two I, of them. Yeah, like, I agree. Yeah. I agree with uh, that song. I was like, this this is how you want to close out your album because I really liked Pat. Yeah, there's some like free jazz elements to it. Mm-hmm. And then Rhoda, the only one not named after their parents, named after a dog. That's right. It was, uh, it was Brit's doggy. Yeah. Each each song is named after the parents or the members. And it, it's so funny to me because when I first heard that fact, I thought like, oh, that's such a fucking indie rock white guy, you know, artsy no, thing to do. It's just more of their like inside yeah. sh- jokey. According goal. to them, I was like, I just thought it would be, I thought it'd be funny. Um, <laughs> I was like, all right. All right, yeah. it's, it's way less cringy. That's just all right. It's cute. And the, hey. the parents were like, hey, "Put in the song ever. Right, it's cool." Uh, like, they didn't care at all. Yeah, it's just funny. Like, oh, this is Ron, and it's just a song that doesn't really reflect Ron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, none of the songs are about anything. No, no, no. Yeah. I think they were like untitled, and then this slapped them on, slapped the names, and that's kind of that's their approach to to lyrics and vocals for the most part, which is. Again, that makes their last album so surprising that lyrics are an afterthought and then you get... So you, this makes sense. You know, like, mm-hmm. we didn't plan vocals, we didn't plan lyrics, uh, and you, you fucking notice. <laughs> like, you yes. can tell. Whereas later on, like, oh, these guys are poets by mm-hmm. accident or something. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a rough album in a lot of areas. Uh, I get the hate that it, it, it gets. I don't hate it. I don't I, love it, though, at all. I don't think it's a rough album. I think it's enjoyable. But uh And yeah. we got the two the two two spectrum, two sides of the coin there. All right. There we go. Hell yeah. But yeah, compared to everything else they did, I Yeah. It's an easy worst in a yeah. very short discography. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So let's move on to their uh only EP. This was released posthumously in nineteen ninety four, but it was recorded in nineteen eighty nine. That's a little bit of like a surprisingly complicated backstory considering it's the same it was released the same year as tweez mm-hmm. it's like so fuck it let's just start it first yeah this is uh this is yeah 1994 is untitled i had heard the other two albums before this i never listened to this and i'm so fucking mad you never heard this before until now this is like one of my favorite Slint songs ever now. This is the first song they played live when I saw them. Nice. They have a very soft spot for this song. Yeah. It's already so much more mature than anything off Tweez. It's insane. It's an, it's it's a different band, pretty much. Um, this is like I know it's like post rock, but these are damn near like like prog songs yeah this was before post rock was a thing though like this is way before post rock was a thing well they kind of get the the they, accolade they get of, it retroactive of inve- yeah like yeah. inventing it being some of the first people though because yeah i'm just like oh man this, this could be an isis song oh yeah oh yeah absolutely and this is a very both tracks here only two tracks very lengthy very repetitive a lot of slow building elaboration. You know how much of a fucking sucker I am for slow build up. That kind oh, of. Oh yeah, that's what this EP is. Yeah, it's uh, some of the most like rewarding thirteen minutes. Yeah. In music. God damn, this is a fucking incredible band. Man. Um. Yeah. Fucking awesome. Awesome EP. I just thought like, oh, it might. It's this. This is gonna be like a quick little like throwaway. Yeah, it seems like that, doesn't it? And then like, I love that song so much. And then I, the next one is a different version of Rhoda. What fucking I believe redeems itself pretty hard. Way better. Way better. It's what made me confident in saying I don't like the Tweez. Exactly. Version. Exactly. This, it's like. Three times as long, yeah. But it's it's, it's kind of like a, it's almost like a different song, but it, it retains the same heaviness. It retains like the the killer riffs that made the original even interesting at all. Mm-hmm. It's really fucking good. But like the the backstory here is like Ethan 
hated how Tweez came out and just like left the band. He went to start King Kong, I believe. And then I believe uh, it was David Paho's friend, Todd Brasher. He jumped in and replaced him. And I don't know. He's fine. He fits like a glove. He, he was clearly a great addition to the band or whatever. And I, I guess Albini had pre-book studio time and then had, you know, and I guess extra studio time and he had no one, nowhere to fill it. So he was like calling bands and then uh, Slint took the offer. Like, all right, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll fucking, we'll do it. Also, like they got to be, I don't know if the the house sitting for Albini was before or after. But might if have been, it, um, you know, might have been before. They had to be so low on the list after oh i know well <laughs> that's true maybe because like i'm just assuming things because i'm just assuming like yeah because he it, has a list of bands that he likes that he's trying to get yeah out, and then it's like the mouth breather the mouth uh, breather the bottom. yeah but to be fair i think i think he really liked the he, band he could like separate the two but i think he really liked the band as a yeah. band i think he really liked working them with them on tweez he seemed like he had like a good a good experience with it and this is like it's so wild that this was recorded the same year. It's unbelievable. It's, it's insane. It's yeah. the same fucking year. Guitars are now beautiful, crystal clear. Mm-hmm. None of that weird chorusy bullshit. The, the heavies are heavy. They don't feel like uh, kind of spread too thin the way they, they did on Tweez quite a bit. And now all of a sudden they're taking their time because Tweez was like 30 minutes long. It's super fucking short. Camp was a little longer, but everything yeah. else was like th- two or three minutes. What's it's funny in the documentary, like that has always been like in the band's DNA. Like they talk about playing like a battle of the bands <laughs> fuck, and taking like an hour to set up. It took an hour and a half and, to set up and tuning for absurd lengths of time. In and, between songs. So it's like it's always <laughs> been in there. It's so fucking funny. They, they should footage to that of them just tuning it's at that show. Fucking funny. It's hilarious. <laughs> Everyone's getting all pissed off at them because they're not playing. Man, imagine. Imagine setting up for an hour and a half, like seeing them do it, like yeah. seeing these fucking kids trying to, it makes them seem like fucking mouth breathers. You know why kids tolerate that shit? Cause you have nowhere else to be that night. What else are you going to fucking do? All you need is a roof where you can drink your 40. That's what you that's, need as a teenager. That's what it's mainly for. The yeah. bands are purely window dressing. Unless they're your buddy's band and you go to, yeah, yeah. to that's all those things are anyway. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's fucking hilarious. But yeah, now they're taking their time musically. They're they're jamming on stuff more. And this is one of the time that you start seeing the rehearsals where the rehearsals are just playing on a single riff for hours mm-hmm. and just seeing what happens with that. And fucking brilliant writing comes from that because you just, when you're playing something for that long, you're going to get bored of it. So you start playing with stuff to change it up. And all of a sudden you've got a new element to the riff now you have a, like an, an extension of it now you have a fucking more complex thing just by playing with the thing for for so long and the fact that they were all so good at that type thing turns into songs like this so the whole thing is instrumental which is obviously it makes no difference because mm-hmm. they're when you don't even notice when their songs don't have singing because it's just so it's so minimal anyway but they they feel so fleshed out and deep and it sounds beautiful uh, it almost sounds like like a fucking different everything, different band, different uh, producer, different studio. It sounds different everything. Yeah, fucking was not expecting to like an EP this much, and uh, I don't know why I was like, oh yeah, I'll just listen to these two albums and never sought this out before. Yeah, so glad I have it in my life now. Angry, I didn't. Yeah, uh, I didn't even fucking the whole time. I have the fucking the whole time. The Jesus, whole fucking that's the cover, people. Jesus Christ, I, I, for, I forgot to switch it on the video. There is the cover. It's actually one of their best covers, really. It's pretty cool. Yeah, because there's not really anything else going on in their other covers. So. Yeah. Anyway, it's a good EP. Hypnotic, soothing, uh, confident, confident as shit, confident and patient. But we got one more. The one. And uh, we're already an hour and we might take another hour talking about this one. Dude, if you talk about this album for an hour, I'm going to. I should not be allowed to talk about this album. That's that's how much I like this. Next so it's just not fair. So let's fucking get into it. All right. This is 1991's Spiderland. <laughs> six fucking songs mike <laughs> six brilliant perfect songs yes i was looking for the pirate ship i saw this small 
Also, the very velvet, because these sound like they were recorded on purpose. This is very velvet underground to Defend I don't, yourself. I don't hear it even a little bit. Just not even a little bit. Yeah. The whole, like, just reading, like, Oh, talking. you spoken word? Uh, yeah. That's, that's oh. an whole element of a lot of poster rock. I don't, I don't associate with... Uh, what I associate with Velvet Underground, Underground is the annoying female vocals and Lou Reed. I, yeah. no, I, I, I doubt they were the first band, but no, I no. do. Yeah, I do the... Well, I also heard these, these guys before Velvet Underground. Yeah. Way before. Which is weird, I think. No, this whole yeah, sh- crystal ball on the table behind it, a girl wearing a. I don't. I don't. I mean, I've, I've heard them years yeah, before Velvet Underground. Yeah, there's no. There's no association. I said okay. Sat down. Then I thought about it for a minute. Asked her if she. Oh, we gotta get to that pop. Gotta get to that pop. Oh yeah, yeah. This is one of the best fucking openers I've ever heard. It is in my life. In my life. God, it sounds good. Oh, simple, but not, you know? Yeah, it also was some... Like the actual first, singing. Yeah. yeah. And this, the vocals sound pretty good here. Yeah. Like, God damn, I love this. I'm getting like, I can't control the smile. That's how much I love this shit. This is what made me. This is what made me what I, what I like in any kind of music. This is, uh... Yeah, this is one of the albums where the the hype is real. It's, it, it's real. It deserves all the hype it gets. Best personal Best favorite. Best personal favorite. This is yeah. uh, this is one of those albums where you hear it and you're like, "Yep, that's why it's a classic." That this is one of the my favorite albums of all time. Obviously, I own a vinyl of it. And I don't even listen to vinyl. Uh, I th- this was uh, yeah again one of those albums. Hear it at thirteen, and then now no music is the same. I've been chasing the high of this album ever mm-hmm. since it, obviously I've, hit, I've found other highs similar, but like it gets harder when you get older. It sure just, does. Just like a junkie. It sure like, does. Oh, I've, I've had it all. What, what do you kids got? Oh, you don't got anything. It's fucking me. dark. And I love this so much that I started going down rabbit holes of bands that were loosely associated that were, you know, the really early post-rock bands like Rodan and, uh, June of 44. And, Stuff like that, where it has like a lot of the spirit, a lot of like you know taking the time, a lot of you hear the slint in it, but it ain't slint, man. There's something yeah. so fucking special about this record that was just you can't replicate anything like this. You try to write something like this, you it won't be. You'll feel wrong, and it won't. I can't even feel explain. Disingenuous, it. yes. There's something so special about every one of these songs that does something very different. There's no two songs that do the same thing, and you know six albums, forty something minutes, lengthy songs, but like. Like you even you hear, don't feel it. Oh God, it's just so breadcrumb trail. I mean, what an opener! Where it's like it lures you in with this really pretty kind of mid pace. You know, right? This is nice and it's it's a it's like a rock sound, but it's gentle. And then that fucking breakdown. Oh my mm-hmm. God, it's just powerful. And honestly, the, the lyrics are pretty fucking nice. It's like these, these guys talking about how he's telling a story of he goes to see a fortune teller at a carnival, and instead of asking for the fortune, he asks her to go on a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. And it's like a, it's like a really sweet thing, and then she throws up at the end of the roller coaster, and like they leave, and it's like a really it's like a story, an interesting sweet story. For once, I'm the mic, and yeah. I didn't like. I know, yeah. I know so much about this album and yeah. this band. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's really ridiculous. But so before we get into like each song, I guess uh, they broke up shortly before it was released. Oh yeah, they they went to college and stuff. I know that. Uh, well, fucking lamos. Yeah, fucking losers. Need sex shit. Uh, These days, no one. Yeah, drop out people. Uh, gang traction in the UK before like becoming a cult classic anywhere else. The UK that like, is put the this common denominator, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's put fucking, this on the map. But like the transformation, it seems like a massive light switch. Like I said before, transformation where it's like, how the fuck? Also, are these the same guys that, that wrote Ron? You know, I, this doesn't make any sense. These are so deep and complex. Also, I know they were uh, 
before they weren't on touch and go but now they're on like a real record label yeah but still this has to be one of the best sounding like independent rock albums it is, ever it is one of the most beautiful sounding clear rock productions ever and it is barely touched like there is so little production on this it's like most of this is just what was in the room that's how good they were this is what they sound like also like always produced by uh brian paulson right who was uh known for his live recording style and minimal takes so fucking nailed it dude. perfect for so this oh, band. so the, the the a little bit of the a little bit more backstory was is uh tweez they wanted it to be on touch and go they sent in you know a promo for it they got no response and a buddy of theirs, this, I forgot her name is Jennifer something. I forgot her last name. She's like, I'll put it out. So she just funded, like just wrote her Jennifer own. Jennifer Hartman. So this started yeah. pretty much her own record label. And she didn't run the, re- like, it wasn't a record label. It was just like, well, it's a record label for this album. Yeah. And then she was just friends with them, put the money up, released the album. And that, that, that's like, that's a really sweet thing to do. But after, uh, yeah, they eventually, I don't know what, what the hell happened. I think they, they were playing some shows and people, the way people describe their shows before this album was recorded was like the way I talk about how I saw them where it's like everyone in the room shuts the fuck up. You look and you pay attention and, and that's it. That's, yeah. There's nothing yeah. else happening. That's good. There's, it's like so remarkable because they're not doing shit on stage. They are standing there looking bored. They're but not doing sounds, dick. But because it sounds so good. It sounds so good. It's such a huge, massive all around you sound. So people see them performing songs from this album and they're like, what the fuck? Holy shit. And word spread pretty like like within that community. Yeah. And I think that's how Corey Rusk was like, okay, all right. You, you, you guys, all right, let's do it. So you get some studio time at this like really state of the art really fancy schmancy studio in like Minneapolis or something. And just the hearing about the recording of this album, it makes me like, it makes me like almost tear up with like, oh, I get it. Like I get things. Like they were so anxious about it. They were so like nervous and uncomfortable and they didn't know what they were going to do. Uh, like they were like procrastinating. That's crazy. They only had, cause they only had three days to record it. Yeah. So they're they're like, what the, what the fuck do we do? Like, uh, they're like procrastinating, finding excuses to leave the studio, to go run errands and stuff. Cause yeah. they were just so nervous. It was such a big task. And then this shit came out. It's like, well, yeah, if you Some, got it, you got it. Something worked. The studio is uh, River North in Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Okay. Yeah, I remember them saying it was like a seven-hour drive or something like that. Yeah. Man, that's fucking, that's gnarly. But, man, to to think that, because one thing that Brian Paulson was saying about this record was like, every time that they would try to do something like production-related after into to the recording, they would be like, it just doesn't seem right. Just... I don't know. It just doesn't seem right. So in the end, it just ended up being like no edits, no changes. It's just, yeah, it just, you know, just put whatever compressors or whatever the fuck you want to do to make, to make it sound clearer. But like, otherwise this is just a live band. Yeah. It's, it's amazing because there's certain things performance wise that let you know that they're playing live, but you would never catch it unless you're, you listen to it 150 times like mm. I have. So Nosferatu Man, which is, so good so so weird so good oh god uh yeah there's like more like it's screaming singing but more more singing than like breadcrumb trail well there's still spoken word yeah there's still plenty of spoken word but a lot of screaming in it too and again the screaming isn't like harsh screaming it's like him yelling desperately screaming so Mm -hmm. it feels so sincere it's so honest and and brian was not a good singer or a singer and he was like he's He's like a legitimately timid, quiet dude and mm-hmm. nerdy dude. So like it, it feels so much more powerful when a guy like that is just losing it. But that song. So first of all, it has brilliant use of harmonics. Anybody who doesn't know harmonics, you tap the fretboard lightly in certain areas. It makes a ping. It makes a ping noise pretty much. And I like uh, when they like, can you explain harmonics to people who don't play guitar? And he's like, it's like. You, you, you touch it lightly. It was the most hilarious, awkward explanation of how to do a harmonic yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah, I was just like, holy shit. It was very cringe. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty funny, though. So 
brilliant use of harmonics. You you hear them like I was saying before. You hear like one little harmonic in the middle of a riff one time, and then when the riff repeats, you hear that same. Little, it's like holy shit, that's like that's calculated. Everything about this is super calculated. But there's one thing that I really love about this. It's such a subtle, tiny thing. The first time the song goes distorted and loud mm -hmm. on the very last bar of that. They, they, they let it ring. They let it ring and then they go in and it goes back to the, the clean part. Dude, but there's yeah. one guitar, it's Paho's guitar, it's still ringing with the distorted note. So every, the rest of the band has started the clean verse again, but he's still letting it ring. And on the one of the next measure, bam, it's clean again. So it sounds supernatural. I don't mean like Santana. I mean, it sounds very natural. I mean, it sounds smooth, like like Santana, and, but but like Santana. So it sounds as though like you don't notice that that's a thing you could do live mm -hmm. until you see them do it. Like, oh, that's just what he does live. It, it like it sounds like you would need. I don't know. It's it's a very natural. Th Everything about this is so natural. That's why uh, I think it's so hard to replicate a band like this because they yeah. were just that comfortable with these songs. I think, uh, like this, moving on to other songs. Washer is like perfect, perfect. One of the most perfect songs ever, ever written. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's again, I forget what song uh, I said was. Uh, oh, uh, like Nod Ding was like the prototype. Washer is fucking. Washer is one of the most chillingly, heartbreakingly gorgeous songs i think yeah, I've, I've ever heard in my life yeah. and that 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 was a song as a kid i was like nothing will ever be the same <laughs> nothing no, will ever no. be the same and that's also the song where brian sings real rough mm -hmm. real rough not a good singer and he's singing gentle very gentle and very quiet and he's not a singer but the thing is that's the thing that pisses me off because that, that's the song that that girl said like i don't understand and that's also the same song that albini when he first heard it was like that was a dumb thing. He shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And even in his glowing review that he wrote of this album when it came out, he he said like he referred to Brian's vocals on that song as pungent. Mm -hmm. But then he's like, no, no, that was my fault. Like mm -hmm. the fact that like I wasn't able to overlook it. No, it's it's the song is brilliant. It's a yeah. brilliant thing, and I, it was listener error. It's like that's, that's, that's what he said, <laughs> listener error. And I agree because yeah, his voice is rough, but that's not the fucking point. And the lyrics are actually pretty fucking heart wrenching. But this. <sighs> <laughs> You got to put it on. Yeah. You got yeah. because I can't, no words can convey this main riff. We're doing wa washer or. Yeah. Okay. That's such a quiet riff. I, I, I missed know. that for years when I was younger. Also, it's so funny. Like, listening to the album and being into it and then it's like oh we want to show you guys something and <sighs> yeah I totally, totally cried when they played this live. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> completely. Oh, she did. I was yeah. in the front row. I was like. <sighs> it's just, yeah. Oh. oh, God. So the song, that song is like nine minutes and it's, it's not long enough. You know, it's not, it's long, not enough. long enough. It's like. A whole album of Washer. Dude, there are a few things in the fucking world as beautiful as that song. It's like. There's, like, there's so many different things in it too because it, it returns to that that riff a lot of times, but at like five minutes in, there's like a variation of it that's all it's altered so slightly, like the bass is doing a different bass line that's not quite as uh, as melancholy as that. It's a little bit more groovy. So hearing that that groovier bass line behind that super melancholy riff, all of a sudden it's like oh shit, that's like. It's a whole new mood to it. It's a whole new feeling to it, but it's still the same gorgeous ass guitar line. It's it's just brilliant stuff like that that again only comes when you've been jamming on it for forever and you just what if I do this instead? You guys keep doing that, but I'll try this instead. And mm -hmm. it, it harmonizes beautifully. It's a yeah, that's that's a fucking band. That's a four dudes working together. Holy shit. A band that couldn't keep it together for the release of the album. No, no. <laughs> they could not. But there's more. Oh yeah, there's way more. There's yeah. so much more. Um, I don't, 
I I feel like you're going. I don't really know how to, but like, Good Morning Captain yeah. is just. I think that's just like a masterclass in like this genre of rock music. Like, yeah. it is it is a full journey. It for a band sure that doesn't is. do prog rock, it is it is a journey. What I love about that is that 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 main the the main hook for most of the song. It's, it's it's this bass line that's almost it's kooky it's almost poppy mm-hmm. it's like happy sounding but that opening guitar line which re- it returns to quite a bit is so creepy and it is so unsettling and, and almost murdery and there there's a uh murdery undertow to yep. this whole album absolutely there's a darkness throughout, throughout the entire entire thing there's no real happiness like the beginning of brick trail is like nice and pretty mm-hmm. Uh, but even then, like, there's still like a hint of melancholy b- behind all of it. It's like, it's a, I don't know what exactly what it is, but for that song, so that main, not the main thing, but the, the opening guitar line, they're like, gling, 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 gling. Uh, I always wondered why it sounded so eerie and kind of cold and thin. Did you find out? Oh, I found out. <laughs> first, first time, first time I ever saw the, this, this doc, I saw him playing, saw Paho playing it and realized Again, just the brilliance and just like fucking around. The brilliance mm-hmm. that comes with just fucking around. He's everybody knows how you play guitar. Really, you you strum here, you you finger here. Well, if you strum on the other side of your hand, it makes pretty much no noise. But at certain places, it makes it, ha- it gives these kind of undertones where it's the note. But like a weird off version of the note, mm, so like he bizarro world, kind of like yeah. exactly like a, like a bizarro like like the the upside down of yeah. of, a, of the guitar. So he plays this riff all doing that, strumming on the wrong side, and then as the song goes on, he switches it and finds this and plays the same thing but clean. So it's like it's it's so smart. And you again, it sounds like a production thing. That's that why I'm so floored by them as a band is because. That tone, you could you could probably make it sound like that with just enough, you know, any mm-hmm. kind of studio effects, any kind of like just messing with the EQ and stuff. You can make it sound like that. But he fucking did it live. He just played the guitar weird to make it sound like that in real time. It's like that stuff, that stuff is why I love music so much. It's like figuring shit out and finding new stuff. God damn. Yeah. God damn, pal. Yeah. I have more to say. If, yeah. if you like, if you want to hear more, I got more, plenty more to say. I mean, um, those are like the, I, the I, there's like two other songs, but to me, those are like the four, the four <laughs> songs we talked about are like the, I think Donnie man is as good as the rest. I anagram for Madonna. <laughs> really? Yeah. Is that where it came from? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> Yep. Wait, where, where'd you find that out? I've been just finding the find- on fucking Wikipedia. Holy shit! The one thing I didn't check. <laughs> 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 fucking, that's hilarious. Because like I was like, why is it a man? Yeah, you no, know, it's not a last name. There's a comma there. It's like you're, they're talking to a man. But I'm anyway, sure it's some stupid inside fucking joke. Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. But so that song, it's the it's complete and utter opposite. It's like the most mellow. It's not the quietest. It's the most mellow because mm-hmm. there's no drums at all. Uh, Brits on guitar on second guitar here, so it's just him and Paho. Uh, there's a little bit of spoken word vocals from from Brian, but it's mostly Brit doing them, and just two guitars, two guitars going at it, no bass, no drums. That I can listen to that main riff for eternity. It's just, I don't know. It's just fucking evil. It's like evil cowboy shit. I don't even know. How it's like cowboy shit. evil sad cowboy. <laughs> it's so pretty. It's so pretty. And again, like just the, the, the lyrics for all the songs pretty for the most part, but that one particularly, they're vague enough to, they're vague enough to really contribute to how lonely the song feels. Mm-hmm. That song is suicidal and lonely. That's it's like, I, and I love that shit apparently. Cause yeah. Holy God, man. It, it's really fucking good. And then the last song, let's just briefly mention cause we six songs. Sure. Yeah. For yeah. dinner, the only uh, true instrumental song. It feels like a, that is the quiet. I, and I quiet know song. that's the quietest song because it was on my phone and we try to sound check. You cannot sound it check with that song. An inaccurate sound check. <laughs> that song. It's very quiet. It's the, it's like a, the, it offers you the much needed respite after washer mm-hmm. because it's like, you just went through this emotional battle. Oh yeah. You need some, 
some breather that's also not ambient noise. Exactly. And it's pretty. It's very, very minimal, but it's there's still a it's song still there. It's still a song, yeah. Still a song there. And it's also the shortest song. It's not short. It's like five minutes or something, but it's still the shortest song. So it's like, okay, we'll give you a little breather here. And then Good Morning Captain kind of fucks you up all over again. Another epic song, yeah. Dude, that when it gets crazy heavy and he starts screaming, I miss you. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh... I mean, the whole album hits you in the in the feels. It really but. does. So there's another thing that I I because I really dissect this album and just to this day I'll, I find try to find something else to dissect about it. The well, one, one day you're gonna end up hating it like you did with twi- like you with did with Tweez. Or- no, I, I never like Tweez. I never like Tweez. No, this one, this one, this is a. So it's like it's super complex. Sure, everybody's doing a bunch of crazy stuff, but it's not. It's not brainy or anything. It's not math rock. It's not. Mm-hmm. There's odd time signatures, but it's just because that's what the song is. It's not because they're trying to make something a little bit weirder or more complicated. So you hear when they go big, when they go super loud, it's always a really simple riff. Like not simple in the way they perform it, but there's like only like maybe like a, it's not like a complicated math rock riff. You know, when yeah. they go loud, they want you to feel that, that we got here. We got here with this big ass riff. Uh, and then the more mellow stuff, you hear like the plucking and you hear the you more know. intricate stuff. Exactly. So it's also like them being familiar with, well, what works in our particular band setting? When we go loud, we're going to be missing a lot of stuff here. So let's, you know, let's condense it. It's not like simple. They're still adding weird harmonics and doing a bunch of crazy stuff, but it's still very, uh, you can, it's readable or legible yeah. rather. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it makes sense because when you go loud, you lose, you lose things. Yes. Yeah. And then when you're quiet, there's room to breathe and exactly. have these nice frilly things. Frilly things. Frilly things is a nice way to put it. Yeah. I, that, don't, I didn't even know if that was a good verb. I was just going to throw it out there and really? hope it landed. <laughs> uh, so vocals again here. I think through the I think Good Morning Captain and Breadcrumb Trail. Nope. And Washer. I forget. There's like, there's like a handful of songs that there were um, they were kind of written beforehand by Brian. Mm-hmm. He recorded demos like in his mo- his parents' car in the garage. Uh, you know, really just uh, it's something that I would do, honestly. Like just just sure. get me away from everybody. Let me just focus. Let me just be isolated. Yeah. Exactly. But they didn't really think about lyrics at all uh until they were already recording it. So they, again, last minute stuff. But what what they did here, because Tweez was like, fuck it. Record shit. Let's just be. Let's, let's get crazy. Just throw yeah stuff over the song. Tell me you got a tape if you're taking a shit. Tell me you got one. Perfect. A whole tape. Hell yeah. Eighty minutes worth. <laughs> That's a All lot right. of shit. So, but here it's like they leaned into vocals not being a prominent aspect by the spoken word thing, which at this time was pretty uncommon. And then, uh, you know, the the periodic screams. It's like turning their objective objectively weakest aspect into a really interesting la- layer and characteristic of the band now mm-hmm. so it's, uh, it's wonderful it's beautiful love it amazing album if uh for some reason you're listening and you have not heard this i mean you should have paused it a while ago on this. yeah but, uh, yeah there's a listen to this god there's this is a oh my god! I, I, you just I, a perfect album. It's in my eyes, is a perfect album. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think that's fair. Yeah, and uh, and this is why I don't like DMX and I don't like Two Life Crew and I don't like fucking who was the other <laughs> shitty band that we covered? Uh, the White Stripes. I know you like them, sorry, but like yeah. I don't like them. This is why I don't like any of that shit because this is what <laughs> what I heard too young. Well, like, well, where are the harmonics in DMX? I don't, I don't hear any harmonics. Where's the where's the telling people to suck my dick and and slant and and the dark dog barking? That's there's a, a gross gross misrepresentation of dog barking in the band's existence. Yeah. I like to believe that <laughs> maybe that during rehearsals there was a dog there, but in terms of Brian barking like DMX, he did not do it once. No. I'm really embarrassed no. by that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I just I think the White Stripes are an album band. Uh, I don't. Oh, DMX. those other two artists saw about the hits, baby. Yeah. You know what? Fuck the please too. Just cause, uh, <laughs> but they want to be, but, oh mm, uh, yeah, they aren't. So sorry, sting. Ah, I'll never Not apologize really. to that fucking cock neck. God damn. His neck looks like a cock, 
But uh, yeah, so they broke up, broke up, reunited in 2005 for all of tomorrow's parties. I mean, all tomorrow's parties, whatever. Velvet Underground song, Alex, Velvet I thought you liked them. Uh, then again, they this for that one show in 05, then again in 07 with a handful of dates in Europe and the US, and then this kind of sporadically stayed together until. 2014 with no plans to ever record anything new yeah and yeah if you if they care about their legacy they fucking shouldn't i suppose so i think i think they could probably maybe i think they could but so but but, so they broke it before this album was released or spider lamb was released and uh it took a while, but eventually it kind of like it made its way and it started trickling down the river and people were like, oh my God, who are these guys? And, and the parents were getting fan mail and stuff and all, all, all this shit. So that happens. And I think they, they reunited for like a couple of rehearsals in like 92 or 94, but nothing ever came of it. Mm-hmm. So even the 05 reunion, that's like around the time I discovered them. So I didn't really like. I, I missed it pretty much. I missed like even acknowledging it. Well, they only uh, played in England. Right. So yeah. I know, but like, I mean like just the fact, oh, okay. and I think it was 07 where I was now aware and I was like, holy shit, Slint's playing shows again. Oh my God. And I, and I remember seeing in like the, the old bitch ass YouTube when it was like old and bitch ass, really shitty camera, you know, Nokia camera footage of those shows and hearing uh, I remember watching the video of them playing washer. And again, this is a shitty old camera recording and it sounded just like the record. And I was like, no Holy fucking shit. way, yeah. no fucking way. And I was so, I couldn't believe that they, they did this shit live and like, you know, that, cause at the time, like I didn't know anything about this album other than the album. So hearing that they did that live, I was like, I have to see them live. And of course they didn't reunite for a long time. And uh, eventually the, the last time, yeah, 2014 it was uh they re- remastered spiderland uh along with the the breadcrumb trail documentary it was released along with it and that's uh, when i finally got to see them and, uh, and cry and all that uh, yeah also uh yeah I, I 2014 was when i saw them so i guess i saw them in that last yep that last fucking window uh it was the last window yeah also uh and even though i didn't really get in man what a fucking like I watched fucking Boris and Slint on the same day and Holy slow dive. Shit. Like, oh my god, it's just kind of surreal thinking about. That's it. pretty yeah. wild. So one thing I forgot to to mention, uh, the way the reason they broke up, I think it was like Brian. Uh, it was like little petty things that yeah. Brian had with the band, like really petty stuff. But no one like really understood how deeply he felt about it. Mm. And looking at him talk, it's like. Oh yeah, he shows no emotion at all when he speaks. He seems really kind of quiet, kind of talks like that. Yeah, yeah how were we supposed to know that yeah. was serious? Yeah, so he left after recording the album. That's kind of when it went went to shit. But the funniest part was looking at all the stuff Brit did afterward because he is a weird guy. You would never get that from his interviews, but he's a, a strange dude. He went on for a while, like he just stopped playing music, moved to New York, I believe, and just started baking erotic cakes. God damn it. Of like, course he fucking yeah. of course he did. If he wanted to learn how to bake, then I guess that's one way to do it. And then he would do a lot of a lot of records under pseudonyms. He for I mean a lot of people know that he he played drums on Pod, the Breeders' first album, which is, in my opinion, the only Breeders album you should listen to. It's a fucking great album. Are you, t- you tell me you don't like Last Splash? I'm telling so. you I don't like Last Splash. <laughs> and like spoilers for uh the Breeders episode. Yeah, holy shit. Uh if it's oh, fine. Way, it's oh, fine. Yeah, I'll but, let it go. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it, like, but the pod is a different thing. And when you listen to pod, it is, and Albini actually talks about this in the, in the doc. He says, it's a really interesting thing when you get a drummer like Brit playing on these three chord pop songs and what he turned them into pretty much. Cause that album has a ton of space. It's a really cold bleak album with happy songs and his drumming. He's not doing what he's doing. He doesn't slant. He's not doing jazzy stuff or weird fills. He's playing it straight, but you fucking feel it just the way you do in slant. Like Mm -hmm. he has a very powerful style and he, he fucking made that album for me. But, but other than that, like this, that's all he he didn't do much. Like nobody does anything. I think Brian went to do band called the four carnation. Uh, but that's like, that's a pajo 
did a lot of he, he jumped was, around from band to band. Yeah, he was in Zwan. Oh, that train wreck. Ugh. And uh, I guess he played with the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. I don't, That's right. I don't know if he like toured with them or. It sounds like a touring thing. I don't, yeah. I don't know either. Yeah, I he mean, was the most busy out of all of them. I mean, yeah, if anyone, if I was in a fucking band and it was just like, oh, you want to take David out? Like, yes, even if we don't need him. Yes. Like. Yeah, he's great. He's like, so great. You just learn a ton of shit from him. What, I, what, I, <laughs> what was the final nail in the coffin for me loving David Paho was when I, I believe I heard uh, or read a thing that Billy Corgan said that Paho was one of the worst people he ever met. I was like, oh, he must be great then. Oh, yeah. He must be, he must be no. fucking rad. If Billy Corgan doesn't like him, he must be fucking so fun. No, Billy, <laughs> Billy Corgan's straight fucking garbage. He's nuts. One he's, of the worst people. He's insane. He's like legit pretty, pretty Le- nuts. Legit bad person. Yeah. Like. I don't know if he's a bad person. I think he's crazy. Oh, no. I think he's the, a bad person. The, the stories I've heard were like, oh, he's got problems. He's like. Like yeah. the stories Kim Thiel of Soundgarden t- talked about him. And I think, I think there's an interview of him interviewing of Billy interviewing Nick Cave. And it's again, a really weird, awkward. Cause he's like, he seems like a socially strange dude. He is. Yeah. He likes pro wrestling. He's socially <laughs> strange dude. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> he took it a step further, bought a wrestling company. He so, bought NWA. Uh, uh, yeah. That's right. It's not, so, not the rap group. Yeah, I know. It's so weird seeing the, the credits of NWA. Like the one time I saw it, it's like William Cor- William A. Corgan. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, hold on. That he, sounds familiar. Yeah. He wants to be called William when he's talking oh, about pro wrestling. Well, yeah. He's, 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 he's got his onstage persona and his offstage persona, That's Alex. bullshit because he's still wearing the fucking scarves. He's well, ugh, well, you know. He doesn't have any. He's like powder. He has no body hair. He's got probably special powers. He needs. Fuck! I forgot about that movie. Yeah. Jesus. What a weird. What a weird fucking movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So you no know, plans to re-record or not re-record, but no plans to record anything. Uh, or reunite. Yeah. Re- reunite. Honestly, if they did like one show a year, That'd that would be fine. That would make me so happy, and people would turn out. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. God damn. Actually, a funny thing about that, that Slint show, uh, that same show, I think I was in line trying to get merch. That's where I got this shirt, actually. No shit. Um, I saw a comedian, Brennan Walsh, there. I was like, and he's not like a big name. He's like a, he's fucking hilarious, but he's like a crazy, he's like a wild man. Uh, he kind of makes enemies with everybody just because he, <laughs> nobody's off limits. Yeah. And uh, it, it's always fun to watch from afar. And I was like, Brennan, why would Brendan, like kind of lower name, strange crazy man brennan walsh be at a slint show it's like but no one looks like that and i was like huh and then i saw later on that he tweeted that he was there and then that same day i was leaving the venue and i turned and i'm pretty sure that was a fucking jason manzoukas from uh oh from the yeah, league. Yeah, yeah, yeah i was like what the fuck he couldn't have been also at the slint show like this doesn't make any that's that's weird I, two weirdly obscure comedians and the <laughs> one i've seen jason manzoukas at cool fucking concerts that guy that was probably him then that guy is fucking cool. Uh, I don't know him, yeah. but just based on the concerts I've seen him at and uh, podcasts, I, I just want to hang out with Jason Manzoukas. Wildman, Wildman. If you're, if you're at a show, there's probably something wrong with you, and I, I appreciate it. Also, if you're at a, a metal show and you see MMA fighter slash pro wrestler Josh Barnett there, it's... Uh, it's horrifying, and it's happened to me so many times. Right? You go and poke him, come bitch. No, this is a little queer. No, I asked him for a picture, and it was terrifying. Why? He said he Maybe. just nodded. He didn't oh. even say anything. He just nodded. Oh, that man! That man lives his life the way he lives his life. <laughs> no one's gonna walk in on his life. Oh, his, no, he's too busy living it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, Josh Barnett also plays Magic the Gathering, like Shorterowski. I think I could hang out with Josh Barnett if he didn't scare me. <laughs> that's a that's a big it's a big problem with friends. I'm often scared of them. Oh like, yeah, uh, uh, you like that, me? <laughs> that's why you don't see Dylan anymore. No, he's too scary. He's too scary. He's too <laughs> juicy, dude. He's too big and juicy. I don't know what to fucking do around him. <laughs> Miss you, Dylan. <laughs> he's not gonna listen to this. <laughs> it's fucking piece of shit. He fucking should. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I guess I mean yeah. Is there a re- there's a recap, but it's yeah, a very it's the same. same uh, yeah. Worst, least, least favorite. favorite tweets. Okay. Best personal favorite. It's everyone's best personal. Everyone's. Favorite. It's a uh, very good album. You know how you. It's a good album. Listen, listen to it. But thank you so much for listening and watching. It's been a fucking massive episode for three records. 
We talked Ooh. about a lot of silly shit. Too. We did. We did. We recounted the documentary frame by frame. Also, we did. I don't know. We did two one album episodes. Here's here's a two hour. Here's a two. Here, here's your juicy episode. I <laughs> uh, suppose so. But yeah, if you want to help us out, support us, uh, subscribe and share and like and rate and all the things and tell friends. And if you want, though, because do they help? Do they really help? They do. Please do them. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Pander Monkey and Alex at Mother Puncture. Uh, but, but, but what am I talking about? Uh, Spotify playlist on Slint. Find a link in the description as well as, you know, plays for every episode we've done uh, for the most part. Every album ever.com, yada, yada, yada. Patreon.com slash every album ever for bonus episodes, ac- early access to to certain episodes, discounts off merch. And of course, you get to jump the line when requesting an artist. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm so glad that we've only been trolled once. And I think it's like a half troll. It's like a half troll. It's not a quite he specified. It was not. It was not a troll. Okay. Move. He the uh, I forget his name. I'm sorry. He I believe it's me, Christian. Christian, you give me money. I'm sorry. I forgot your name. Um, <laughs> he specified that it was not a troll move that. Uh, well, I don't want to do spoilers, but I yeah. will explain his point of view when right. we get to when it. When we get to it. Uh, but it's fun, though. We get a bunch of requests. You know, we get to as many as we possibly can, but it's way, way, way easier if you give us money. Honestly, everything is really a lot easier if you give us money, especially me feeding myself. So please do that if you'd like. And I think that's it for blood. Yep. Well, that leaves us to. So I'm getting less. <laughs> I will strangle you slowly, <laughs> staring into your cold, dead eyes. <laughs> you take this from me. Because I have I was the whole week, I was like, I know what I'm going to pick. If he tries, I might lunge at him, <laughs> like, knocking everything over. <laughs> but we got to close it out with some, some big, some spicy, some juicy. We going Nosferatu, man. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. So thanks so much for listening and watching, everybody. See ya.